Welcome to Zero Knowledge. I'm your host, Anna Rose. In this podcast, we will be exploring the latest in zero knowledge research and the decentralized web, as well as new paradigms that promise to change the way we interact and transact online. This week, Tarun and I chat with Florian Tramer, assistant professor at ETH Zurich. We talk about his earlier work focused on side channel attacks on privacy blockchains, and then quickly shift the conversation over to machine learning and adversarial research in that field. We define some key machine learning terms, tease out some of the nuances of ML training and models, chat ZK ML and other privacy environments where ML could be trained, and look at why security around machine learning will be incredibly important as these models become increasingly used in our everyday lives. This was one of the first episodes I've done looking at machine learning, and it was a really great way to kick it off. If you do want to hear more of these, do let us know. Now, before we start in, I want to remind you to check out the ZK Whiteboard Sessions, produced by ZK Hack and powered by Polygon. This is a new series of educational videos that will help you get onboarded into the concepts and terms that we talk about on the ZK front. It's a great place to start. And you may also want to join the ZK Hack Discord to keep up with other members of the community going through these and other learning resources. I also want to just share there's a new batch of job ads on the ZK Jobs Board. Check out open roles at ZK and cryptography focused projects like Alio, Anoma, and the Web3 Foundation. The ZK Jobs Board is a great place to learn about relevant projects and types of roles that teams are looking for. This could be your next opportunity to work in the space. I've added the link to both of these in the show notes. Now, I'll ask Tanya to share a little bit about this week's sponsor. Today's episode is sponsored by Mina Protocol. With Mina's zero-knowledge smart contracts, or ZK apps, developers can create apps that offer privacy, security, and verifiability for their users. Leverage Mina and zero-knowledge tech to bridge the gap between the real world and crypto, bring online data easily on-chain, and access ZK properties from other chains and devices. Since ZK apps are written in TypeScript, developers can easily get started without learning a custom programming language like other ZK protocols. Head to minaprotocol.com forward slash ZK podcast to learn more about their developer boot camps and open grants. That's minaprotocol.com forward slash ZK podcast. So thanks again, Mina Protocol. Now here is Anna and Tarun's interview with Florian Tramer. So today, Tarun and I are here with Florian Tramer assistant professor at ETH Zurich, formerly PhD student with Dan Bonet, who also spent one year at Google Research. Welcome to the show, Florian. Yeah, thanks for having me. And welcome back, Tarun. Excited to be back as usual. Cool. So this episode was inspired by an earlier episode that we did at at, uh, DevConnect in Amsterdam back in April. So in that conversation, we were talking about, I mean, we were talking about a lot of things. I'll link to that in the show notes. But one of the ideas we came up with was like using adversarial modeling in things like peer review or trying to get a more adversarial and dynamic environment in things like science, biology, places where maybe there's not as much adversaries in cryptography. And when you think about it, like in cryptography, that adversaries actually push systems to be better. And so, yeah, we were talking about that. So we put that out there as an episode and then Pratush picked it up and tweeted at us basically that we should invite you on Florian to talk about adversarial modeling, adversarial research and what that looks like. And I know your focus has been much more on machine learning. And I think that's what most of this episode is going to be about. But why don't we start in a little bit about you? Sure. Yeah. During my computer science studies, I I got very, very interested in, in cryptography and security. They were sort of the the first areas that I was really interested in doing research in and, and was ultimately then also what I started off with my PhD with, with Dan at Stanford. And kind of a bit at random, actually, uh, I had met Dan at a, at a security conference a few months before uh, starting my PhD, where I, I was actually presenting a paper that had to do with machine learning security, which was sort of a, a kind of a one-off project I thought at the time that I had worked on before starting uh, my PhD. And talking with Dan, he was kind of like, oh, do you, do you want to continue doing work on, on this field for your PhD? And I was kind of like, okay, sure. And then we kind of got started on this. And it was a, it was a pretty exciting time to start working in this area because very, very few people were already doing this in the security community, actually. I think there were maybe 
two people who, who got a PhD or maybe three people who got a PhD on, on machine learning security before me. So I was kind of uh, very nice to, to be kind of at the forefront of, of this field for a while. And then actually in, in times during my PhD where I got a bit bored with, with machine learning and wanted to do something else, uh, cryptocurrency security was, was often my sort of guilty pleasure, mm -hmm. um, building off on earlier collaborations I, I had from, from before my PhD and in particular with Ari Jules at Cornell. And so we would often just every couple of months reconnect and, and figure out something we could do in the, in the cryptocurrency space. And so we had some projects there on bug bounty systems for Ethereum. Um, gas token is something we worked on at some point as kind of a, a fun little project with, oh, yeah. uh, with Phil, Diane and, and Lawrence. And then, yeah, this sort of went on and off over the years. And uh, maybe the last big project I did in this space a couple of years ago was looking at security vulnerabilities in anonymous cryptocurrencies, so in Zcash and Monero in particular. And this is actually how I first started collaborating also with uh, with people at um, at ETH Zurich, where I that I've now joined as a as a professor a few months ago. Uh, one month ago, actually, to be cool. precise. It's all very new. Congrats. Uh, yeah, thanks. And so f for the moment, I've kind of, I've left cryptocurrency research a little bit behind for, for the time being and focusing primarily, again, on, on machine learning, security and privacy in the space. And yeah, that's kind of what my, what my research group does at the moment. Very cool. I want to actually explore a little bit of that work you had done on the side channel attacks and privacy tokens. And then I want to dive more into the machine learning side of things. So can you walk us through that work? Yeah. So the, um, the background there was at some point I was just thinking, you know, there's, there's all this, all this new cryptography that the people are excited about and trying to implement. And then there, it, it's very complicated stuff. Like some people were calling it like moon math. And I was just kind of thinking, like, we, we can't get very simple cryptography right. Mm. Like, people are breaking, you know, like, TLS implementations uh, every couple of years. There must be, there must be like, things lurking lurking here. And so I spent kind of a summer just learning a bit how, how Zcash primarily uh, works and sort of trying to look a bit at whether there could be flaws in the cryptography itself and kind of coming short on that and that I think they actually did a, a tremendously good job at uh, sort of designing and implementing the, the cryptography parts of the protocol. And then at some point, we kind of got interested in, in looking at sort of broader security issues that, that one could find in a, in a system of, of the scale of, of a cryptocurrency. And so this got us interested in looking for, for side channel attacks. And um, the point here is basically to, to not try to to break the cryptography directly, but to, to sort of look for signals that are somewhat outside the threat model that one usually considers from a cryptographic perspective. So things like yeah. how long do messages take to propagate through the network? How long does it take for a node to decrypt certain messages, uh, process certain messages and so on? And here suddenly this was kind of like a, a treasure trove where as soon as you started looking at the system from this perspective, there were a bunch of, of flaws that became apparent very quickly. What was interesting was that the, the reason a lot of those flaws existed, in particular in the case of Zcash, was kind of due to the fact that they had just built on the original Bitcoin design, which was not meant to be an anonymous cryptocurrency. Or like a private setting. Exactly. And yeah, so yeah. they, yeah, pseudonymous is, is definitely something that Bitcoin was striving to do, but they definitely had a, a much weaker sort of privacy threat model than Zcash. Yeah. And so there were a lot of things that Bitcoin nodes do that are perfectly fine within the threat model of Bitcoin, but suddenly not fine at all uh, once you're moving to, to Zcash. And so concretely, one, one attack we, we discovered was that, um, so in Zcash, when, you, when I want to send you a transaction... I'm essentially going to encrypt this transaction in such a way that only you can decrypt it and sort of find the coin that get, that that is spent. Uh, what that means is that I'm just going to send this transaction to everyone in the peer-to-peer -peer network. And so everyone has to kind of decrypt this transaction or sort of try to decrypt this transaction to see if the coin was actually meant for you. And then if it is meant for you, you're sort of going to do a whole bunch of, of extra work just to make sure that the coin is actually spendable and so on. Um, and so what that means is that if you are the recipient of a transaction, you're going to be doing more work 
than if you're not the recipient of a transaction. That's kind of point number one. Point number two is that the, the Bitcoin client processes transactions one after the other mm -hmm. in a single thread of execution. And this is essentially all you need for the attack. So what that means is that I can send, if I find some transaction in the network and I want to know if it's if it's for Anna, um, I send this this transaction to, to Anna's uh, node and I also send her like some, I don't know, some ping message. And then I just wait to see how long it takes for Anna's node to respond to this ping message. Mm -hmm. And if Anna was not the recipient of this transaction, she's going to process the transaction extremely quickly and respond to the ping right after. And if she was the recipient of this transaction, then it's going to take her like about a half a second longer to process this transaction. And, and only after that is she finally going to respond to my message. And so this is something that's quite easily detectable, even across a, across a network. And so these were the type of attacks that we discovered there. And um, we then extended this to, to Monero, which has a quite a bit of a different system design, but we found sort of similar vulnerabilities mm. uh, there where you could also just sort of time network packets and sort of figure out from this uh, kind of what, what a node was doing with incoming transactions. This This model, like the attack here, is, is it only working because in Zcash at the time, perhaps there was like the people who were actually running, like to, to have an account, you had to at least have, I think, a light client. Like you can't, you're not borrowing services from anyone else. So like the node runner and the address holder could be one and the same. Because that's yeah, exactly. what that sounds like. You were basically running your, your node, your peer-to-peer -peer node and your wallet were essentially part of the same, of the same process. Yeah. And, and so there's very clear sort of concurrency issues between those two very distinct parts of the protocol. And that's that's essentially the vulnerability here. Got and it. this is what Zcash then then fixed as, as part of our of our vulnerability disclosure. And I think since then they've also been, been sort of striving to to completely redesign this architecture to to actually really isolate the peer-to-peer -peer node as much as possible from sort of the the much more sensitive wallet component of the mm. of the client. Had any sort of side channel attacks been explored in crypto before? Or were they sort of ignored because everything is transparent and it's fine if if things leak, except for in these kind of like private systems? Yeah, that's a very good question. Uh, from from what I recall, I mean we had we had sort of looked through through the literature to see if, if things like this had been had been talked about before. I remember there was a, a sort of an early Bitcoin discussion at some point about about some some similar attacks to this and in the case of bitcoin this is maybe less i mean it, it's still an attack in that you, you might know someone's say bitcoin address uh, but you don't know physically who this address belongs to and so you could use the same attack in bitcoin to essentially connect a, a bitcoin address to an ip address this is something that people had talked about at some point in Bitcoin and because of this also kind of decided that, hey, we should really separate the peer-to-peer -peer and wallet component. Mm. And so I think by the time that we looked at this, this wasn't a vulnerability in Bitcoin anymore. It just turned out that Zcash was using a sort an of an earlier version, version yeah. of the of the Bitcoin client okay, that, okay. that was sort of before the discovery of this of this issue. And yeah, it was kind of the the problem when you're yeah, when you then have fixes on on sort of a, a client, but kind of for legacy purposes, this this hadn't been integrated into Zcash. So, so actually, I think this is actually more of an issue in, in proof of stake right now um, because the validators are selected in advance of them actually being the person validating a block, right? So, like in ETH, in ETH two, I think it's like you have two to four, sorry, six minute window. Uh, where you know basically the next validators on to, for the next six minutes, you know things like Tezos, you know for like forever the a whole epoch. So there's basically this thing where in proof of work you you have this like uh, adaptivity property, which basically means you don't actually know the identity of the you don't know the probability distribution you're sampling from. Like people can drop out and join. In proof of stake, you always know the probability distribution for a certain amount of time. So 
basically you you always sort of know the next like some number of validators and basically if you could figure out from their coinbase transactions and the addresses they're sending them to what their ip is you can ddos them cause them to be griefed i don't think anyone has you know mo most of the ways this has been taken advantage of is not actually for ddosing it's usually for bribing the validator so like an avalanche and solana people definitely pay at validators directly for for front running and most of the reason is because they know who which validator is at which block in the future so it hasn't been done i wouldn't be surprised if basically the same type of thing ends up happening there because people haven't separated these two things yeah this is i think sort of generally a problem as soon as the the entities that are kind of in charge for the consensus mechanism are are sort of easy to know or or you can somewhat guess guess who is going to be a validator, yeah, you, you run the risk that if if those entities are kind of de-anonymized, then yeah, you you have these attack vectors. I know that actually Dan and and one one of his former PhD students, one of my lab mates, Saba, they had I think this was because of this issue they had worked on this on this problem that they called a secret leader election, which was essentially about yeah, selecting validators in a way that couldn't reveal who they were. Yeah, I, if it didn't need threshold fully, fully homework and encryption, I think it would have been implemented. Like people have made sure. like p proof of concepts of it, but yeah, I, I I think none of the production networks unfortunately are very close to to implementing it. Not because they don't know about this, they just don't really have any other options. <laughs> this is something we can get back to when we talk about machine learning, where it's unfortunately this is something that's kind of a recurrent theme at the moment that many things would be cool to have but are essentially just unimplementable at the at the moment because the cryptography is is still too slow. <laughs> it's just interesting talking about security in this context because like whenever I feel like whenever we talk about security on the show we are almost always talking about the cryptographic security or the engineering security we're ne almost never talking about the side channel security or these like externalities. It kind of made me think, like you mentioned, sort of the IP address. I know, I know you've switched focus, so I don't know if you're if you're following this, but like, have there been other, I don't know, inquiries into whether or not IP can be revealed? Like, I do vaguely remember last year. I think there was something around like NFTs, the image pulling to like if you were whole, if you had. There, there's definitely malware that took advantage of people signing transactions without paying attention to who or what they were signing, which then would eventually transfer your shitty board ape to someone else. <laughs> no, no, but this one was more about like where they were pulling the image from revealed your IP ah. address and you could be doing that from multiple accounts and it would like link your accounts to each other. I think that was what I, and it was like not and all wallets. And then it DDoS some... you or no, what no. was sort of the- I think tack. it was just linking. It was like basically you, you have two d different accounts with two different- images or whatever, two different JPEGs, two different, but because you're using it on the same uh, device, it would just link those two together. I, I, I mean, you know, people like Chainalysis and TRM, 50% of their modeling is not purely on-chain stuff. It's, it's, it's external metadata they attach to an address. A lot of it IP is that basically like, you know, if you're a user who goes to Coinbase or to Binance, when they use chain analysis, the sort of agreement they have with chain analysis is that they give them the IP that you logged in from. So like, let's say I go to Binance, I say withdraw to X, ah. then Binance in order to do KYC using chain analysis is like, hey, we'll sell you the IP data. So this already exists. It's just not, you don't even have to be very sophisticated to get it. So, so, so from that, from the perspective of like, how are we catching these hackers? You know, like the, the Ronin bridge hack, right? We were cover 30 million yesterday. Where do you think oh. that came from? That came from like someone basically going to an exchange and doxing themselves. <laughs> Crazy. Yeah. And I guess you could imagine that people would want to use anonymity tools for things like this. So something like connecting to, to the cryptocurrency network, say over Tor. Which I remember that when, when we worked on this project with Zcash, this was actually something we were interested in looking at is like, do most Zcash users just connect over Tor? Because this would mean that a lot of these attacks would not be as, as useful. But I remember that at the time, this was actually 
not easy to do. There was some technical reason, I don't remember what it was, that actually made it hard to combine Zcash and, and the Tor network. Uh, I don't know if this has been fixed since, but this is this is sort of where, yeah, where you have sort of very, very different security models that, that kind of end up clashing with each other, where you have extremely strong cryptographic protections on one hand that give you sort of near perfect sort of privacy within the transaction pool, but then the sort of system side uh, privacy is uh, is a different matter. Interesting. You know? Back then, were very few people using the Tor set up together with Zcash, it sounds like. Yeah, I, I remember that there was, it was essentially not, not sort of recommended that okay. people do this. Yeah. Crazy. I want to now, like, I think we should move the conversation a little bit over to machine learning and the work that you're doing now. You mentioned to me before we started that you had spent a year at Google Research. When you did that, were you focused on like adversarial machine learning research or, or something else? Yeah, it was really sort of a, a continuation of the of the research I had been doing during my my PhD. At which point I had actually started collaborating with with a bunch of people uh, at Google already. I was actually in a in a research team there that within Google is maybe a little unusual in that it's it's a very it really feels like a like a sort of an academic environment in that the the sort of the main thing we were doing was really just sort of basic research without necessarily a Google product or, or Google data in coming into play. So it was, it was a very, very close to what I was doing before. And uh, yeah, quite a, quite an exciting year just because, well, you get access to a, to a bit more resources than you would as a, in, in your average academic lab, for sure. Cool. Yeah. I, I remember I actually first heard about you doing this stuff right at the beginning of the pen, like after SBC. Uh, 2020 mm -hmm. where, where there was this like Aurora paper and like you and Thomas Steinke were like posting something on Twitter about it. Oh yes. In Insta hide. Yeah. Le le let's not go there. <laughs> <laughs> that was a pretty funny online, uh, kind of thing. Uh, were you at Google then or were you still? At no, that was before that was my last, my last year of PhD. Yeah. But it was, was one of the, one of the projects I did then in collaboration with, with people like Google was sort of, yeah, looking at the at the privacy of this of this scheme and sort of breaking some of the privacy guarantees of it. Yeah. So so the high the high level thing, I guess, sorry for for listeners who who haven't heard about this stuff, is that there is kind of this idea that people wanted to use very coarse grained quote cryptography. I wouldn't call it it's <gasps> definitely not cryptography. It doesn't really give you any of those guarantees. Um, but people would be like, oh like I did a bunch I, I ran this sort of like hash of like the the machine learning weights you can't really in, figure out reverse engineer you know something about the model or something about the input data I was trained on and that turned out to not be true uh, and so I, I think maybe that's the theme, a lot of the theme of some of the things you worked on so yeah and that it's it's kind of there's there's a lot of hope I guess in in this space that that one would be able to somehow bring ideas from cryptography or sort of the the rigor of of some some of cryptography uh to problems in in machine learning security or privacy and this has so far just proved to be extremely hard to do and i think there there's sort of a fundamental reason for this is that in in cryptography we kind of deal with very abstract concepts we're just sort of trying to you know encrypt a bunch of of numbers, a bunch of zeros and ones, and um, and that's about it. In in machine learning, is sort of there's there's actually sort of an underlying natural phenomenon that we're trying to capture, and this just doesn't play very well with with cryptography in in general. I wanted to actually explore a little bit more about how machine learning training works and then talk about this adversarial research. I think this is one of the first times that we actually are talking machine learning on the show. We, obviously, we've mentioned it here and there, but tell us a little bit about like how these systems are trained. Yeah, I guess one, one way to say to, would be to say that no one knows. Um, and that's the point, no, right? You're not yeah. supposed to know how they're trained, because if you did, that would be bad, I guess. No, I mean, more that we don't, we don't necessarily know that well why they work. Oh. Or, but the, the sort of the gist is you, you take a huge amount of data and nowadays, this literally means sort of going to every corner of the internet you can find and just downloading troves and troves of, of data. 
And then just having a, a huge model, which is essentially just a function, essentially, that you're trying to fit to this data. And so, for example, the, the big rage at the moment is to train language models. So there, what people re literally do is just download, yeah, terabytes or petabytes of data and train a function that sort of given the beginning of a sentence can sort of predict what's the, what's the next word that's going to come. Mm -hmm. And that's kind of a, statistically, this is a well-defined problem somewhat. And it turns out that, yeah, if you, if you have a function that's kind of big enough that you represent with, with enough kind of learnable parameters and you have enough data and you have enough GPUs to, to sort of optimize this function for like a couple of months, you end up with a model that's incredibly good at sort of predicting what is the next word that comes in a, in a sentence. And if you then just run this model over and over again, it starts generating text that looks somewhat reasonable to humans. Mm. Um, I think what's, what's most incredible about these machine learning models we use today about deep learning models is that you, you train these models to do this sort of one specific task that's kind of maybe a bit boring. But then somehow by doing this, the model needs to learn some representation of, of or internal representation of what text means, what different words mean, and so on. And this isn't, this is really not something that we optimize the model to do. Literally, all we tell the model to do is predict the next word. Yeah. But by doing this, the model somehow learns that the word dog and the word cat are similar to each other or man and woman are similar concepts in, in some contexts and the opposites in, in others and so on and so forth. Mm. And this then means that you can just take one of these models and, and then very easily uh, repurpose it for, for a whole bunch of, of more specific things you might want to do with it. So teach it to become a, a, a customer service dialogue agent or to, to write poetry yeah. or to generate dialogue for, for an online game and all these things. And so this is kind of where the field is at the moment. This is kind of the, the paradigm that's been very, very successful in the past few years is that some people train these gigantic models, usually on some task that isn't particularly interesting on its own. And these models are then always trained by some very, usually some pretty big company that just happens to have the resources to do this. And then people sort of build on top of this uh, and find all kinds of sort of cool applications that they can that they can build on top of of some of these models. And um, yeah, now we we have models that can generate sort of very realistic art. Uh, where again, the the sort of way these models are trained is is uh, has in, in a sense nothing to do with with how people use these models in the end. All these models are really trained to do is just to take an image to which we've added. A bunch of noise, a bunch of Gaussian noise, and remove the noise. And it turns out if if you do this long enough, the model kind of just also learns that if you give it only noise, it's going to generate an image. And um, and so kind of we end up sometimes with these somewhat fascinating and even surprising behaviors that emerge from from something we really didn't optimize these models to do. Mm. Uh, all just because they were optimized on billions and billions of, of data points to sort of just learn to try and understand some of the internal statistics of, of these data sets. Yeah. I think like everything you just described though, sounds real great. So what is the, what's the problem with that? Like what's the breaking point of this? <laughs> yeah. So the, the issue is essentially that these models end up being very, very good, somewhat on average, and then Every once in a while, they'll they'll just make incredibly stupid mistakes or sort okay. of things that that are completely wrong according to sort of the way we see the world, and then very often we we don't really have a good idea or a good sense for why these mistakes occur and how to fix them. And so, as as a as an example, this is sort of something that's been observed now about six seven years ago and kind of gave rise to this field that we now call adversarial examples in machine learning was this realization that we could train these models. In, in this case, this was for classifying images. So we were training these big machine learning models where we would just give them pairs of images with, with a label. So we'd say, this is an image of a dog. This is an image of a cat. This is an image of a train. 
And after doing this a billion times, you actually end up with a, with a model, a function that you can give some new image and it's going to be very, very likely to, to give you sort of a, a correct or a reasonable labeling of, of what this image represents. And what, uh, what some researchers at, at Google at the time then discovered is you can take some image that say the model uh, will say, well, this is an image of a cat and the model is correct. And then you change sort of the high order bits of, of every pixel in this image uh, in a way that is like physically impossible for us to even notice yeah. uh, like that, that the image has changed. Um, and you give this, this new image to the model and the model will now tell you this is absolutely a picture of guacamole <laughs> um, or of an airplane or of a fridge or of, of anything you want, essentially. And it's kind of this super surprising phenomenon that, that people have, have sort of worked very hard to, to understand over the years. And I think we're, we're not quite there yet. There's a bunch of sort of competing theories as to why this problem exists and even some, some theories that suggest that this problem might just be inherent of sort of learning from very high dimensional data. What's your view from a theoretical lens of like cryptography, right, is focused on take an arbitrary input stream, generate something that's epsilon close to the uniform distribution, right? Like the entire world is just this little epsilon ball around the centroid of a probability simplex. But machine learning is the opposite, right? You want to learn this structure that's like extremely non-uniform and like certain parts of the space are sampled significantly more, certain parts are zero. And obviously, as dimension goes up, you're, it's even sparser, right? So do you view it as, a, yeah, this sort of the thing you're just saying, like, is there a theoretical limit to how well you could ever possibly encrypt such processes for learning, not just the output and input, but like the actual like mechanics or not? Because, you know, I, I think in the zero knowledge space right now, there's certainly a ton of people trying to be like, oh, we're going to do ZKML. I'm not convinced that a lot of these things actually don't also leak a metric fuck ton of, of side channel information. And so, so I'm just curious, like, what's your, what's your gut feeling on, on like, sort of, is this like an impossibility theorem lurking around or is there sort of some like, Hey, maybe, maybe we can get away with it. I, yeah, I think it depends on what you want to achieve is if, if what you're aiming for is some notion of confidentiality, kind of the thing that, that crypto cryptography is, is best used for, then we do have theoretical Barely practical is maybe the better word. Things like like fully homomorphic encryption, multi-party computation, zero knowledge proofs, and so on, that you can of course apply to to any algorithm, and so you can apply them to a machine learning algorithm. And so, in in particular, what this means is you could very well say, I want to train my machine learning model on this data set that is sensitive, and so I want to do this in a way where I first encrypt all my data, and then I do my entire training with fully homomorphic encryption and end up with a, with an encrypted model and in a way that I've never actually seen the, the data in the clear. Uh, that is sort of, in principle, something you could do. Um, in practice, very, very far from feasible, I would say, at the moment, especially for, for sort of very large models that, that people might be interested in using today. I, I guess not even just that, though, right? Like, in theory, even if I did do that, but then I could take the... I could run, imagine I could run inference sort of privately. So I like mm -hmm. have some model, I can run the steps of the model in a private manner. You give me right. a CKP at the end or, or FHE. Yeah. The problem is I have the input output pairs. If I have any information about the input output pairs, that is correlated to some something about the execution trace of the model. So yeah. the question to me is like, will we ever actually get to the point where there's a set of models that it's known that somehow knowing enough input out, the amount number of input output pairs you need is just large enough just like the model's dimensionality or not, because like mm -hmm. somehow that seems to be crucial to like ever ensuring privacy in these things. So you mean here kind of privacy of the model itself? Yes, of the model itself. Yeah. yeah. So, so this was actually the, this, uh, this project I mentioned, uh, the first machine learning project I ever worked on before starting my PhD was on, on this very topic, which we call model stealing attacks where the the point there is to say yeah that if you if you have a model that's you know sitting somewhere behind a cloud api and you want this model to to stay private maybe because it uses proprietary information or you want to charge people for using it then the fact that you let people query this model is 
inherently leaking information. And at some point with enough queries, you can probably reconstruct a local model that's kind of similar to the, to the one that is supposed to be hidden. And this is inherent because the model is a learnable. And so because the model was learned in the first place, well, it has to kind of be learnable when interacting with it as well, or at least we, we sort of don't know how to make a, a machine learning model into, into something that cannot be then learned also by someone who interacts with it. Um, whether this is feasible in practice depends a lot on the size of the model. So for, for somewhat simple model sizes, this is, this is feasible and usually not particularly expensive. For sort of the very large models that people use nowadays, so like, I don't know, OpenAI's GPT-3 model, which they actually, th this is actually behind a, an API and people pay for it, most likely trying to steal this model and sort of reconstruct a similar model locally by querying the API is going to be way more expensive than just reading OpenAI's paper that describes how they trained this model and sort of spending, you know, a couple tens of millions of dollars to, to do that instead. Just to clarify, because it sounds like what you've just talked about is when you talk about ZK ML, you're basically talking about either using ZK to protect the data set or using ZK to protect the actual model. But can you define when you say the model, like, is the model predefined? Is the model something that the researchers are doing or is the model the output of all the data? Ah, uh, yeah, sorry. That's kind of a, an issue of terminology, which which I, I must say probably also caused some confusion in the original Twitter thread you mentioned uh, that, that kind of led to this, where I would say in, in most of science, when people say model or modeling, yeah, they kind of mean a a process of kind of, I don't know, like learning information about the world or whatever, or, or a process of doing science or something. Whereas in machine learning, when we say model, we mean like a, a function, like, or, or a, a program that, that you can run that, that was, uh, yeah. So it's kind of the, the output of the training of process, the training. people will call a model. I see. And this is kind of an unfortunate naming scheme that I know that people have complained about quite a bit because it, it actually causes confusion when then going to people in, in other scientific domains and talking about models. But yeah, for lack, for lack of a better word, that's, that's what we use. In, yeah. Th in this gets learning. back to, this is more a philosophical question about the notion of epistemology of like, do you actually have to put in the, the features of the thing you want before you try to infer whether reality obeys it? Or do you just say, here's what reality does. Can I go backwards? And that forwards and backwards thing is, sort of the main problem in philosophy of science. So I would say that it's not exactly solved. <laughs> Most likely when, when we hear about sort of adversarial models or something like that, we think of machine learning, but it could actually mean something a bit broader, which I guess is something we'll, we'll come back to later. It's funny because I guess for me, when I was hearing about sort of the adversarial approach, I mean, and at least the context of this podcast, it was actually that crypto itself is so adversarial all the time, partly... Mm -hmm also the economic incentives. Yes, there's the security break, but like if you find a hack or you find a bug, there's like true like treasure at the end of the road. So there's a lot of motivation for it. In the case of ML, is there motivation in the same way to break them? Like what you just described, even with the photos, it's like, who cares if the photo thought it was a cat and then it thinks it's a yes. fridge? He, he just gave you the greatest example, which is the open AI API, right? Like, I mean, people have made sort of versions of that model because it's, you know, that's the crown jewel for open AI. That, that is but I guess this is, this is, yeah, this is an, uh, an application of sort of stealing a model, but for, for sort of evading a model or sort of making it give bad decisions. Yeah. The sort of cat to guacamole examples are, are cute, but ultimately not, not very security relevant. And this is, uh, this has been a bit of a, of a pet peeve of mine with, with this field for, for a few years that people sort of always kind of say that, oh, this is a security concern, uh, but they never actually go and look at, at real security uh, systems where, where machine learning is used. And uh, the reason is that, uh, I mean, I'm sure there are many of them. It's just that a lot of them are kind of hidden. So like uh, as an example, online content moderation is something where machine learning is going to be used a lot. Like every time you upload, say, a picture to Facebook or Twitter or whatever, I'm sure there's a bunch of machine learning models in the in the background that are going to take a look at this and and try to flag it if it's mm -hmm. inappropriate. And um, it's already happening. I mean, there's that big exactly. example with Apple, 
right? I think it was they they yeah, had yeah, flagged. Yeah, exactly. They had actually seen, I think, a photo, but it was the context was missing and right. flagged it. Yeah. And then, of course, everything that's uh, on the on the side of malware detection, spam detection, intrusion detection, all these things have been using and are using more and more machine learning in them every day. And so here, of course, there's a very clear adversarial setting and very clear incentives for, for attackers to try and evade these systems. Actually, the, the online content moderation setting is the one that I think best best illustrates the a sort of an attack vector for something like an adversarial example, because here the end goal is always to show content to a, to a human, right? When you post something online, you essentially, you want it to be seen by many, many people. Um, and so here, what you really want is to make sure that you can post, say, something offensive and that will look offensive to, to humans, but that the machine learning model is going to say, oh, this is perfectly fine. It's a picture of a fluffy dog or something. Yeah. And so this, this is kind of the, on the image side, maybe the, um, an easy, an easy attack scenario to describe the sort of adversarial setting in, in machine learning today that I would say I'm, I'm most concerned about and I think has the most potential for harm is more on the side of attacks on the training data. Uh, this is what we call a, a poisoning attack. Again, with sort of nice, nice illustrative terms, I guess, in, in this field, people like, like naming things. And the concern here would be something like, you know, uh, someone training a model like GitHub's copilot that helps to write code. And by tampering with the training data, you sort of make sure that the model is just going to write insecure code or something. This is actually, the, there was a research project from some people at Cornell a few years ago that uh, that showed that you could do something like this. And it's pretty cool. Or even even just as a, a sort of a, a trolling attempt, right? Like these models cost tens of millions of dollars to train. And you can imagine the, the PR nightmare it would be if like, I don't know, Google spent tens of millions of dollars to train one of these, say, language models. And then once the model is trained, it turns out that if you ask it, which is the most evil company on earth, it tells you Google, because somehow someone managed to put all of these training examples somewhere in the training set. And so this is, I think, a type of attack that I think we're going to start seeing more of in the future, just because there there are sort of incentives to do these kind of things for, for bad actors. And it's probably not that hard to pull off because these models are just trained by literally pulling sort of terabytes of data from everywhere across the web. Hmm. I'm now so curious what your research is, because this, like, what do you do? Like, are you trying to break them? <laughs> what are you a, doing? A lot of, yeah, a lot of my, a lot of my research has been kind of attack focused with sort of the, the end goal in mind of, of really trying to figure out what, what real attack vectors uh, look like and, and whether, whether some of these kind of generic attacks that, that people have, have been thinking about for machine learning models for like the past 10 years or so, whether, whether they are actually practical, whether, whether this is something that someone could, could reasonably pull off. The end goal, obviously, being that we could we could also come up with with some reasonable defense ideas, mm -hmm. but uh, it, it seems like right now you can sort of either look at machine learning models in really in the in the absolute worst case and sort of say like yeah if if I give you my machine learning model I tell you exactly how it works it's like trivial to attack can you can you find a defense and this is just a it seems as of now a, a hopelessly unsolvable problem. Um, unfortunately. Whoa. And so you could think of, well, but then why, why don't we see Twitter and Facebook and so on, like constantly under attack? And I think the, the reason is that, well, these, these systems are not open. They're, they're hidden from you. They're not that easy to interact with. There's probably a lot of security through obscurity at play here, but it actually, it actually works. And so I think there's a bit of a, something we don't fully understand yet at least from from kind of the academic research side is like how hard is it actually to attack some of these models that that people really use in production and what are kind of you know like pragmatic maybe security things we can do to to kind of limit the attack surface of these models that's that's kind of one thing i'm on the side of security of machine learning that i'm i'm really interested in the other thing which we talked about a bit previously is is all all that has to do with kind of the privacy of training data 
where there the the big issue actually with with these models that people train today is that they're they're very large and so the models tend to have a very annoying tendency to sometimes just memorize some of the training data that they saw this is again somewhat annoying because this is not something even that that cryptography can solve for you like even if all your data was encrypted and you did fully homomorphic encryption or multi-party computation or whatever if like the output of your computation, which is like a machine learning model, itself leaks the data that it was trained on, well, cryptography sort of says, well, that's, that's fine. That's part of the game. Um, but with machine learning, this, this actually happens. So we had a project two years ago where we looked at OpenAI's GPT-2 model. This was the, the precursor to GPT-3, which is actually a, a fairly small language model by modern standards. And we just found that if you, if you sort of let this model generate text, in some rare instances, it's just going to generate, you know, someone's phone number, email address, uh, fax <laughs> number. Uh, we actually, we had, we had one example we found where it really like there was, was a specific person whose entire contact information appeared like two, three times on the internet in like wow. some random patent documents or something. And the model just knows this person by heart. <laughs> and it's very strange because it's really some, some random person. Uh, n not someone famous at all. Huh. And I guess what that gives away is that th that data was used in the in the creation of this model. Yes. Okay. And you could argue, well, this is this is data that's from the internet. It was already sort of publicly available. But I think this is a can of worms that's that's about to explode at some point. That um, we've been all putting like a bunch of data on the internet and w without without any consent that this is ever going to be used by a machine learning model. And there's now just a bunch of companies that just sort of go and scrape all this inf information and just say, oh, it's public information. Well, also they sell it. I mean, <laughs> and then they sell the model. And so then there's, <laughs> yeah. there's questions yeah. of copyright infringement that are interesting as well. So yeah, these are, these I think are, are kind of interesting and somewhat worrying also legal questions that are going to pop up in the, in the coming years. Yeah. Actually. So, so I guess maybe a, a more sort of theoretical question is, you know, I guess in the last maybe few years, more on the theoretical side, people have really cared about what I guess people call ML fairness. I feel like it has 5 million definitions that are inequivalent. And I get that people are winning prizes and like best thesis of the year or whatever for it. But like, I, I generally read the papers and I'm not particularly uh, convinced that there's something there. But there is this trade off between whatever notion of ML fairness you have and sort of some notion of privacy, do you ever see those getting united? Because like there is sort of clearly some connection between privacy in, and, and resistance to adversarial models as well and fairness. And there's sort of this triangle between the three of them. We don't know the space of that. Do you ever see those sort of merging? And I, I guess we could start by trying to define fairness, but like half the definitions I've seen actually don't, are inequivalent. So I like, I'm not, it's not like differential privacy where we cohered on one definition. That, that's the main issue, right? Yeah. As, as you said, sort of in privacy, we have a definition, differential privacy, which is sort of mathematically very, very nice. I think there's, there are settings where it doesn't really capture everything you want under, under sort of a privacy label, but it's, it's sort of a very specific notion of privacy essentially says whether you yourself contribute your data or not doesn't really make a difference, which is which is sort of very nice to have. And then there's other things we care about in, in machine learning, like yeah, fairness, as you mentioned, and actually robustness, which is the, the thing we talked about earlier, sort of perturbations to, to inputs and so on. These are things that are extremely hard to define what we really want, what, what sort of our ideal looks like like in the fairness case it's sort of well we want the model that's fair but probably if you go and ask uh 20 different people and 20 different judges what what that means you're going to get 40 different definitions and that's kind of the issue is that if you fix a definition some mathematical definition of what you might mean by fairness then you can maybe optimize your model to to try and satisfy this definition this is something that people have done but then someone else might come around and say, well, my definition of fairness is actually different. And by sort of optimizing for your definition of fairness, you've made my definition of fairness worse. And th this actually happens. And robustness is, uh, of, of these models has, has the same issue is that when, when we sort of say we want, say, uh, an image model that is robust to sort of small changes of its inputs, 
We also don't know what that means to say small changes. Like ideally, what we would maybe want to say is something like anything that a human would consider as small, mm. but this isn't something that we can mathematically define. And so instead, people say, well, I'm going to define a metric that says I can only change every pixel by so and so, uh, such a small amount. And then you can optimize your model to sort of try to be robust for, for this specific definition of robustness. To, to be fair, differential privacy still has a metric to that for like adjacency. Yes. <laughs> yes, but which I would say is more, yeah, is discreet. It's more discreet usually. So I, I there's usually some like minimum distance you, you that's natural in your problem versus fairness. Yeah, and this is maybe just more in line with something that we really want from a privacy definition. And uh, yeah, but I, I agree. I mean, I've actually written at least two papers recently that that sort of call into question whether differential privacy is really sort of the right definition of privacy when it comes to training some of these language uh, machine learning models yeah R right i guess my question is like somehow i feel like there's some sort of and maybe this is just because i am been in crypto too long but like some type of sort of like impossibility theorem where like you you have fairness robustness privacy you get two out of three or like there's like some way you can't get all of them you can never get three <laughs> or like you, you know like if you get all three it says something about your model's predictive power like your predict model's predictive power goes down or something right i think between privacy and fairness there's there's certainly there's certainly trade-offs there this is something that people have already explored either empirically or also theoretically where it's kind of inherent yeah that if you if you want a model that's private in the sense that it it can't uh, depend sort of too much on on the data of any particular individual and then on top of that you might want a notion of fairness that's sort of very tailored to to individuals well those are clearly at odds and it's kind of impossible to satisfy both of these at the same time more kind of empirically, what, what people have found is that when you enforce privacy of these models, what you're essentially forcing the model to do yeah, is that any time it sort of finds a very small subgroup in the data, so some, some kind of outlier data, you have to ignore, or the model has to sort of ignore this data or it can't possibly be private. And then, yeah, when you then use this model after the fact, you find that it its performance on some very, very small subsets of the population, uh, of the data population, can be much worse than if you hadn't tried to make the model private. And so those those things are are clearly at odds, yeah. And so this is something that at some point is a, is a matter of policy, of of sort of public perception, of sort of which which values which public or societal values we, we want to try and enforce in these models. And this is a very, very hard question because on the one hand, first of all, we need to agree on sort of what those societal values are. And that's kind of a very hard problem on its own. And then once we agree on what the values are, we sort of have to find a way to formalize this into, into mathematics or into code so that we can actually train a machine learning model or write so software that sort of abides by by these rules yeah another way of saying it is i don't want the british parliament voting on whether what definition of fairness i sh ha I'm, I'm legally obligated to optimize in my objective function in some way right? Right. like you just don't really want that in some ways but then at the same time there's this like intrinsic sort of weirdness about the fact that some of these models probably should have some notion of being like less biased, but like I, I, I'm not sure exactly where, where and how they'll go. I think a lot of this also just comes from the fact that these these data sets that people currently collect to train these models are, for a lack of of better word, just complete shit. In that they they just really go and just collect what whatever data they can find online because it's really sort of the more data, the better. And I mean, if you've spent any time on the internet, well, you know that whatever you can find on the look, internet look, is, G G is... GPT-3 GPT trained on 4chan sounds like a way right, to, yeah, to like, like on, kill all humans. <laughs> on, on average, it's, it's, not, it's not particularly good data, I would say. And, and there's definitely, yeah, entire portions of the population that are going to be absent or, or underrepresented in this data. And so this is, this is a concern and, and one that I think requires a lot, a lot more work on, a lot more research and sort of finding good ways to curate some of these data sets that people collect and sort of figure out how to work with, yeah, with issues of consent of, of whose data you, you include 
of trustworthiness, like from, from which sources are you actually going to pull data so that you don't, you, your, your model doesn't just end up being poisoned very easily. And then, yeah, I'll sort of whether the data is representative of kind of the, the world you're trying to learn about. Yeah, I think like these are the questions that people in crypto who are like, oh, we're just going to like bolt on FHE or ZK to ML don't ask themselves because I think it's more important to solve these first before you even like just throw. Otherwise, you're just like, I have a bazooka. Let me go kill a bunch of squirrels. And you're like, well, wh why? Like, maybe that's not maybe you should ask yourself why you built the bazooka. Yeah. And actually doing it in a private setting, it means like it's even less understandable in a weird way, like by starting in the transparent one, at least maybe you can explore it a little bit more clearly. Right. Although technically none of these are really like none of the models used in production like GitHub or OpenAI are particularly transparent. I think that's why stable diffusion is like such a so, sorry, stable diffusion is this open source version of sort of Dolly. You could think of it as like open source version of Dolly. And like the reason that's just like caught fire is because just like all these people who are like ML's too inaccessible were suddenly like, oh, actually I can use it. But I always hear like a lot of vitriol from people in crypto who are like, oh, like if we just did like all this machine learning shit in, in FHE, like we just solve all these problems, like fuck the big companies. And it's like, sure. But at the same time, I don't really see how you've eliminated any of the inherent biases in these things. Right. Like, and, and right. the biases are probably even worse than the strictly like whether I can infer the model weights. Like, yeah, sure. Like inferring the model weights is probably like, a version of like, hey, I can figure out this person was in this data set. But there, there's sort of some like missing missing thing there. And like cryptographers are just like, they, they love to be vitriolic about big companies. But like, I feel like they're missing the fact that like just throwing cryptography at the problem doesn't like help you. It's all sort of one one specific part of the problem, which if you consider it a problem, which which can be yeah, sort of centralization of data and and the fact that people people don't have control over their own data and how they want to release it to the world and so on which yeah you you can argue is a one of the big problems with with the way that we do machine learning today but yeah it it is ultimately a sort of a, a small part of the privacy and security issues that you're you're going to have with uh with machine learning models today and so we we'd love to use to be able to leverage cryptography more. So kind of a, a really fascinating open problem in the space that I thought about for quite a while. I'm sure others have as well. And so far, there just hasn't been any progress would be to say, can we build a model that is more robust to attacks, um, but only only against attacks that are, you know, like computationally bounded, sort of the way we think about attacks in cryptography. And in cryptography, that's that's always what we do. We know that sort of information theoretically, there's extremely little we can do. So we, we have to think about computationally bounded attackers. And we have a lot of cool techniques that allow us to do that. In in machine learning, for sort of all these attacks we're talking about here, like things like data poisoning or perturbing inputs to evade the model and so on, we're always just thinking of these things in information theoretic terms of like the model is kind of either it resists all attacks or it's broken and we we don't really know how to how to find sort of something in between where we can say the model is not inherently uh, absolutely robust but sort of finding a way to attack it is is hard and expensive and this this would be very very cool if we could do something like this but we we have no idea how <laughs> So I sort of want to bring this back to what had kind of originally prompted this interview, which was this idea of using more adversarial testing or adversarial re like modeling for things in science. And the one example that we had been exploring was like, could peer review be fixed by creating an adversarial motivated kind of system of... And this is not so much the research. This is this is like creating adversary, like basically market testing it to get the better, you know, results. So peer review currently being done in universities by people who, you know, may have their own like research that they sort of want to push through becoming reviewers is what we talked about in that last episode. So, yeah, I don't know. Is there any sort of research spaces or ways that you're thinking about, like changing other parts of science? or that you think these adversarial like setups could actually help? 
Yeah, if, if anything, I would say our, our current peer review system, in, in particular in computer security, is already way too adversarial. Um, oh, really? It's, like, it's too adversarial? Yeah, it's one of those areas where I think pe because people just have a bit this, this adversarial mindset of like, oh, everything is broken or can be broken, that people's prior on any paper that they're going to read is like, this is bad and this is broken. And so overall, it's actually, it's, it's sometimes refreshing when you, when you go and publish in a, in a field other than computer security, because suddenly people are a lot, a lot nicer, nicer and more encouraging. <laughs> and yeah, it's, uh, <laughs> but does it make for more rigorous like results? Like, does it, doesn't it, isn't it sort of like good to be challenged uh, in every way? Yeah. So I think this is, this is certainly something that in, in cryptography and computer security is, is kind of nice that, attacks and defenses are both kind of first class citizens when it comes to research and so you you have this kind of back and forth anyhow and it also means that if you if you want to do research that kind of challenges other research it's it's publishable you just you call it an attack and uh, and you publish it whereas my my guess is in if you go into other fields like if you go into into biology medicine physics and so on writing a, a sort of a negative result is is much much harder where you sort of go and say oh these these other things that people have published in the past don't actually work and so this is certainly something that that is i think very good to have and it's very healthy that that we have this in our in our community it does yeah it sometimes creates a bit adversarial settings also where you have to be a little bit careful not to not to make people angry when, uh, or or to be angry yourself when someone comes along and says, "Oh, I, I broke your work from from like a few years ago." So it's. Uh, but but then then on the other hand, you have the problem in biology where you have these kind of like the Alzheimer's stuff where it took you know, it took like twenty years to disprove something, but twenty years and you know hundred billion dollars of investment into trying to make drugs for the wrong thesis. Right. Mm -hmm. No, and so definitely, I think this this should be encouraged that that people sort of do this type of research in in any field that sort of goes and and questions kind of other research that's already been done and sort of reevaluates uh, things. Um, this has been actually particularly hard in in machine learning so far because everything is very empirical, and so usually what what happens is someone someone will write a paper saying, "Oh, we have a new method that is uh, more robust, more secure, whatever." And then a few months later, someone comes along and writes a paper saying, "No, actually, here's a new attack, uh, or here's a better way to evaluate things, and everything is completely broken." And so it's a bit like sometimes people say it's a bit like symmetric cryptography in the in the '90s that like everything gets broken left and right, and we have sort of no idea what we're doing. But it's still, it's kind of because of this sort of healthy back and forth, uh, we do now also have a much, much better understanding of which things do not work and clearly do not work, which things seem promising and sort of how we should evaluate uh, things more rigorously. And so, yeah, I think that in that sense, having having this adversarial mindset and this adversarial back and forth is definitely something that's that's useful in in science. Yeah, I think the uh, the other question that we talked about in the last podcast was really about like how do you incentivize bad results? Yeah. Um, and in computer security, there's the natural incentive. It's like right. uh, it is it is viewed as a form of advancement that you broke something, right? Yeah. But in like machine learning or biology, there's always this thing of like, oh, there's like too many people who've like staked their career on like this thing working. Mm -hmm. And we'll do everything possible to make sure that that the gravy train keeps rolling. And so I, I guess the question was, like, how do you kind of bridge that gap where you can, like, find the nice middle ground between those? And maybe it doesn't exist, but it, I think that was sort of the, the pipe dream. <laughs> yeah, it's a good question. I think it connects a lot with just debates people have been having for for years and decades about how we should be measuring impact in, in science as a whole, right? Like, people have these have these debates all the time about sort of saying, oh, we really shouldn't be measuring citation counts or number of papers or H index or whatever, because each of them is fundamentally flawed. And in the end, we just, we, we, I agree, uh, each of these as a metric is, is just not particularly good. But if we had sort of a, a gold metric of, of what it means to do impactful science and we could just focus on maximizing that and then sort of, uh, this would make things easier because then whenever a new paper comes out, 
uh, whether it's a positive or a negative result, we could sort of try to to answer the question like does it does it contribute to to the advancement of science to to impactful science? And this is just a very, very difficult question to answer. Even when it comes to positive results, I mean, we have so many examples in cryptography and in machine learning and in probably every other field of extremely impactful papers, the original zero knowledge paper being a prime example, that have just been rejected uh, like three, four times before being accepted. I mean, I mean the, the greatest example in distributed systems, I guess, is, uh, you know, Lamport's part-time parliament, which was the thing that described Byzantine fault tolerance fully. But he wrote it as this paper that was sort of a huge troll. He wrote it as if he was an archaeologist who found this Greek civil ancient Greek civilization whose parliament used uh, sort of like a BFT mechanism for voting. And so like basically every CS journal rejected it for 10 years until it had like a thousand citations mm -hmm. as like unpublished work and then eventually kind of got accepted. Wow, cool example. Which at that point you could say, well, that that's ultimately the, the metric people care about. So it doesn't really matter whether the, probably the paper could have been never published. I mean, I don't think Satoshi's Bitcoin paper was ever published. And I think no academic venue would publish it because it's sort of it's not written in the way that we expect papers to be written the the technical things it it describes are are somewhat vague or and but in the end you you can't deny the huge impact it's had and so yeah it, it clearly shows that there's there's many different ways to measure measure impact and peer review i think just in general is not is not particularly good at, at finding this yeah cool Florian, thank you so much for coming on the show, sharing with us your kind of story, some of your work you were doing in cryptography and with privacy tokens all the way to the machine learning stuff. So thanks a lot. Yeah, thanks a lot for the very fun uh, discussion. This was a great time. Yeah. And yeah, thanks for introducing my audience and me to kind of some of the work that is happening over there. This is, the I think, the first time we dig into it. So very cool. I want to say thank you to the ZK Podcast team, Henrik, Tanya, Rachel, and Ari, who helped on research this time around. And to our listeners, thanks for listening. Thanks.